Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I'm showing these works because this is something I'm working on and it's also sort of relevant and sort of in discussing the indigenous um, struggle and the way that, that I'm articulating that within my work. Um, there's a number of different mediums I work in. Uh, this is obviously graphical. So um, I have uh, graphic design skills where I've created these or I've created these drawings and then digitized them, um, which is how they've existed. But I also work in paintings and murals um, and in performance art. So this is uh, a mural that I did in Denver. Um, I actually did it in a heavily, heavily, heavily gentrified area. Um, which uh, kind of looks like I'm not trying to make friends, uh, but, uh, but it was there um, and, it, and it's meant to challenge, it's meant to raise questions. Um, likewise with the mural work, um, our statements such as this, um, this piece is actually in the basement of CU Boulder and it's in the colors of the school. Um, I worked with an office to, um, this is in the basement of the art and art history building, but if you walk into that basement, it's like a whole corridor. So I did the entire, uh, all, all four sections of this wall, and um, they wanted me to do this piece, and they wanted me to do it in the school colors. Um, so, so there was a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, dissent happening within my work, and I mean, I think most people expect some artists on some level to do that. And, and um, but it's also meant to sort of raise questions that, you know, places like colleges are in, like colleges and cities are in places that are traditionally um, been native spots. Most of the highways and roads that are created in the United States um, have at one time been trade trails. And so there is a lot of parallels to, uh, where these cities are. Denver, uh, which is about an hour from where I live, was a major trade place. So people would come from the mountains because we're right at the foot of the Rocky Mountains on the east side. Um, people would come down from the mountains to trade. People would come from the plains to trade. People would come from the north and from the south. All the trade in Denver and in places like Kansas. Um, they just recently found a group uh, or a uh, series of intricate spaces that denote buildings and trail routes and all sorts of things in in Missouri and uh where they oftentimes has been dismissed like well there wasn't a lot of Indians here there wasn't a lot of this there wasn't a lot of that um and in fact uh there's some significant trade routes through those spaces um so this statement isn't just flippant um but actually is rooted in the fact that um a lot of the spaces that we now reside uh, as Americans are also spaces that were originally occupied by indigenous communities and indigenous people with indigenous trade routes and uh, systems of trade set up um, that were pretty elaborate. Uh, this piece is called uh, The Duality of Indigeneity. Um, it's in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, it is the same face uh, with a different set of hair and different set of clothing or no clothing. Uh, and um, it's meant to ask the question, uh, which one is more indigenous? And the answer, of course, is, is that they're both indigenous. Um, that our identity is so much rooted in these stereotypes that it doesn't allow room uh, to move around. This is actually my son. He was the, the model for it. And um, when I did this, his hair was actually uh, more uh, of the figure on the right. Um, his hair is now uh, incredibly long. And so he, um, he's been going through this, this whole process himself, which is, uh, I think, really interesting. Um, and I also want to say, uh, and, and Reverend, if you can sort of, you know, uh, um, validate this, if, if anybody has any questions, and wants to put them in the comments section, we can continue, I can talk along the way. I can talk on my own all day, uh, but we can put questions in there if something pops up that you guys have some questions about. Um, and if Reverend uh, Capo could, could facilitate that, that'd be great. I will. Awesome. Um, this is a new piece, I say new, it's a, it's a few years old now. Um, this is my oldest daughter, Sage, who you'll see will make an appearance in a couple of other things. Um, this piece was actually created specifically because I wanted to make something that was more general, something that would apply to anybody. 
um, something that would be positive. And uh, she is indigenous. You can actually tell by her uh, earrings that the figure is indigenous, which is sort of an inside thing for a lot of native people. Uh, native women take incredible pride over their earrings. Um, and they're, they're usually um, beaded and there's like all sorts of different ways to create, you know, elaborate and beautiful indigenous earrings. Um, and so that's why that's there is ultimately to sort of to say that she's indigenous, but to create something that is more general that people could sort of understand and get behind. Um, I've been very fortunate because this piece has uh, transcended as I had hoped a lot of those things and has become, uh, I think one of the more iconic pieces that I've been able to create. I'm, I'm, I, I love this piece and I love what it sort of looks like and what it represents. It's very dramatic. The lighting is very dramatic. Um, my poor daughter, you know, just for, from the backside, uh, I set up lighting. So she's, there's a huge light, like right in her face. And I'm trying to get this dramatic lighting so that I can illustrate this appropriately. But what's really neat is it, it's actually, uh, it's, it's existed in these other spaces, uh, in public spaces. So this is in Denver. Um, I have one in uh, Boulder. There's one in Telluride, uh, Colorado, which is about six hours for me because it's in the mountains. Um, and there's one in Duluth, and um, I don't see any reason why it won't continue to exist in these spaces, but it is meant to just simply be a positive um, statement. Um, when everything was happening, you know, with Trump, I know when he first got into office, there was a, a movement that people were saying, like, hashtag resist, and, and I understood that and, um, and even appreciated it. But as years have gone on, I've sort of noticed that having something that um, is positive and can apply to anybody that's not necessarily about, um, you know, race or, or even, uh, you know, gender identity or any of those things that that could actually apply to everyone. And that's what this was meant to be about. Um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this one too. Um, so I'm actually known as a performance artist. Um, this is, uh, this is how I made my, uh, sort of made my bones as an artist and kind of put me on the map. My very first piece, which is what uh, an image of which you're looking at, is called The Last American Indian on Earth. And it's sort of a tongue in cheek piece that is specifically about um, uh, stereotype and the perception of, of native existence. And so everything that I'm wearing in this image is actually store bought. Um, the, the headdress is made in China. The beadwork was also made in China. A lot of these kits and things come from Mexico and places like that. And so I am by all intents and purposes, um, I am the embodiment of the stereotype. Um, this is meant to be like this for a few reasons. One is, is that Americans have no idea what they're looking at. They see the headdress and they're like, oh, that's real. Oh, look, it's a, it's a real native person. And then they react accordingly. Um, native people look at this and they're like, yeah, that's pretty hokey. And so I was purposefully taking things that already existed, things you could just buy across the counter and applying them to what I was wearing and then walked around as though I was a real native person. And uh, this image is actually not staged. This image, it, it happened in real time. I was working uh, at the beginning of this effort. I was working with my wife and a friend of mine to document it through photography and through film. And um, so my wife and I worked very closely together on uh, how to take these pictures and things. So she's the one who took a lot of these pictures. And if I remember right, I think my third child was in her belly at the time. So she's just like a total trooper. Um, but this is a real photograph. They, this man wanted to take a picture with me. He wanted to point at his Cleveland Indians hat. And, uh, and so that's, that's what happened. Um, but it's also this idea of like being in space in real time, right? Being in positions that could, any American could be doing, any American could be standing in the cereal aisle trying to choose between uh, Fruit Loops and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Lucky Charms. So, you know, once you add the headdress and you add all these elements to it, it changes what you're looking at. And documenting the way that people would react and interact became a really important part of this. Um, this was actually done in Washington, DC uh, in, um, on Columbus Day. So it was legitimately on Columbus Day. And for those of you that can't see it, it says Native Americans discovered uh, Columbus. Um, the actual whole statement is uh, lost at sea. 
um, is, a, is a big part of it. Um, looks like there's somebody that wants to get in. Um, I got it. Also, we have a question. Shoot. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of your politics, would it be fair to say that although you present images of identity, you are critical of identity politics and trying to create art that everyone can identify with? Yes. Well, yeah, I kind of. <laughs> I think that it's um, it's a, a, a few different things, honestly. Um, I mean, I think identity is important. I think identity is is personal, um, and uh, you know, I don't expect anybody to just know or understand that I'm a native person right off the bat just because they see me. Um, it might help because my hair is long and you know often braided, but ultimately. Um, this is a complex set of conversations. There's a lot of native people that don't agree with anything that I have created. Um, and so I think that that comes to this really interesting and important place that things um, are, are really nuanced and different depending on who we are and where we're coming from. And I, I am not a huge fan of um, relying on uh, intent, because I think that there's a lot of people that had supposed good intents <laughs> coming into this country at its beginning, and it ultimately affected uh, Native people in horrific ways. Um, but at the same time, I also think that as somebody creates something, um, and, and, and I'm t obviously talking about myself, as I create something, I'm being very specific and very deliberate about the choices that I make and the things that I do. And I'm not interested in necessarily uh, whether or not somebody agrees with it or if it's benevolent in its existence. Um, I'm concerned as to whether or not it's true. And so that becomes a really big part of, uh, of this process for me. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, so in terms of, uh, would you fair to say you have presented images of identity? Um, are you critical of identity politics and trying to create art that everyone can identify with? No, no. In fact, um, that's actually been a really difficult part of being a full-time artist. I've been able to create um, enough notoriety to uh, basically do whatever I want to do. Um, but I've also always basically done whatever I've wanted to do. There was a time when um, I was being told that my work was uh, was good, but that I need to scale back on the, the sort of Indianness of it. Um, and I don't agree with that. Uh, I think that creating work that is familiar is helpful. I think speaking in a language that people understand is helpful. But I also think that Native people as a whole are in this really difficult place uh, where we are beholden to this perception of outsiders. Um, so a really good example of that is um, there's a art market in Santa Fe, New Mexico that sells and produces uh, native art that is made by native people and also by native non-native people that are creating work that is uh, native in its subject matter. Um, there's never been any recognition of a greater uh, contemporary native art effort um, and any of those things are ultimately regulated to this corner in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But most of the people that are creating work there are creating work that is familiar. Cowboys and Indians, you know, Indian with the buffalo skull, uh, you know, down in uh, the desert of Four Corners, teepees, all those things that are recognizable are ultimately the, um, the subject matter of these works. And the reason for that is because the buyer's market is dictating what the what native art is supposed to look like. And so that eliminates the freedom of being a true contemporary artist in terms of how most contemporary artists work, um, particularly, uh, if I could be frank, um, white men. Uh, that art is ultimately, well, uh, here's a really good example. I had an exhibition um, that was part of a large group show effort with the Smithsonian in 2016. And uh, I was being interviewed. My piece was um, actually a gigantic teepee filled with uh, paintings and things. I had a whole performance aspect to it. And I think I have a picture of it in here I can show you. Um, but uh, the reporter said, so you're a Native American artist. And I immediately understood what she was saying. And I, and I, um, I 
kind of played dumb and said, well, what do you mean? And she said, uh, well, you know, like you show your work in Santa Fe. And I said, you know, this is a really interesting question um, because I believe myself to be a contemporary artist that is informed by his indigeneity. But what you're saying is that I'm a Native American artist, which means that you're commodifying my work and you're placing it into a corner based on your own ideas and your own perception. But I have an honest question. When you talk to a white American man, do you ask him if he's a Euro American artist? And the answer obviously is no. And so those identity sort of set of uh, the identifying sets of languages um, that are placed on someone like me don't apply to anybody else. I therefore have a difficult time being in contemporary art spaces because I'm oftentimes not invited unless there's a commodification of my work that will sort of enrich the space that I'm going to be in. How come I can't be a contemporary artist that's informed by his own personal cultural identity? And so um, I don't create work that's always going to be familiar or is always going to be safe because I don't feel that I need to. Um, this is a really good example of that. This is a performance piece I did uh, with an installation. So the paintings and stuff in the back are also mine. Um, it's called Redskin. And what it is, is I have four antagonizers in this image that are around me hitting their mouths in sort of that stereotypical Hollywood, uh, you know, Indian war cry uh, position. But what they, and they're all friends of mine, so they're all willing participants. Um, <laughs> I had to coax some of them into it because this is kind of terrible. The homework that I gave them is that they had to go to an article about the Washington Redskins specifically and skip the article and go to the comments section and to use the language that exists in the comment section as language that they would use to communicate with me in this space. Uh, much of that language is referred to as microaggressions, small uh, pinprick things that are said to a person of color that other people might not even realize happened. And my idea was to take these passive aggressive statements and to place them in one place on one person at one time uh, for a significant amount of time. We did this, this performance piece for six hours. And it's meant to shine a light on these things that people are not aware of. Um, and so this was done in 2014, I think, um, in the middle of that sort of mascot debate when it was probably at its biggest. Um, this is actually from that Smithsonian exhibition I mentioned to you. Um, there's, it was a group show it was an interesting set of circumstances because um, this group show had all kinds of people from all over uh, from different places. So the woman in this image that I'm standing next to on the left, um, her name is uh, Anita Yo Ali. She's a Cambodian refugee and Muslim woman who uh, lives in America. Um, her piece, uh, we were in the arts and industry building at the, on the National Mall, which is basically a big X. And at the apex of that X was a fountain and they built a stage over the fountain and that's what we're standing on. Um, this is her installation. And uh, she's surrounded by, uh, I think a hundred American flags. And the premise of her work in 2016 where there's a fair amount of anti-Muslim rhetoric happening on the campaign trail. Uh, her question was, can a Muslim American be a patriot? Uh, which I think is a completely fair and valid question uh, that has, I think, a lot of different arguments associated with it. Um, this, this show was called A Culture Lab on Intersectionality. It was called Crosslines, A Culture Lab on Intersectionality. And um, there was over 40 plus artists and the Smithsonian, the, um, the Board of Regents and the Office of Public Affairs had a problem with two artists and it was me and it was Anita. And they censored our work. They said that we could and couldn't do certain things. Um, they wanted me to actually take my work to the National Museum of American Indians and, and uh, share uh, it with the director. Um, his name is Kevin Gover to make sure that my, my work was appropriate um, and to check my identification card to make sure that I was a real native person that I had the right to create work with this voice. Um, and likewise, Anita ultimately landed in a place where they said the only way she could participate is if she didn't speak to the public within the bounds of her performance art. And they put that in writing, it was in her contract. And so Anita and I were having this shared experience and we became very close as a result of it. And we decided 
that we wanted to do what the title of this exhibition was and we wanted to intersect. And I came into her space and we stood together for this photograph. And um, we were lucky to get this photograph because this whole thing lasted all of maybe six minutes before I was forcibly removed from the stage. And um, it, it was a set of interesting circumstances. Like, I don't know, I knew that this was important, but I don't think I realized how incredibly moving it is until I was up there. Um, the experience of being a Muslim American in 2016 with a campaign trail that was, was spewing nothing but vitriol against Muslim people talking about Muslim bans and, and also putting Muslim Americans into a database. Um, but then on likewise, as a native person, as an indigenous person being surrounded by uh, these symbols of something that has ultimately affected um, the uh, population and livelihood of indigenous people and how interesting that is. And to have us standing together turn into this amazing moment um, that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I wanted to, there's just like a few more things to, to share with you. Uh, this is a performance piece that I did with my daughter. This is my oldest daughter. She was 12 at the time. Um, it's called Invisible Lost Movement. We are both dressed in traditional regalia. She is wearing a what's called a jingle dress. I'm wearing a men's northern traditional outfit. And if you've ever been to a powwow or ever seen pictures of uh, regalia, most regalia is very colorful and beautiful, which goes along with dancing and movement. And so there's, there's all these different things that are happening. And I had this idea to build regalia, uh, traditional regalia, and to strip away color and to strip away sound and to strip away all of the things that inform this, uh, which is why we're, we're draped in all black. Where there's beadwork, we're wearing, we've got black on black beadwork, we've got black leather work, black ribbon work, black everything. And it's meant to stand as a metaphor. It's one of the few pieces I've done that's specifically uh, a metaphor for in native people that we exist, but we don't exist. That you can see us, but you can't see us. We're here, but we're not here. That we are but a shadow of our people. Because even standing in the sunlight, you can see some details, but you really can't see too much detail at all. And I end up looking like a silhouette. Greg, you have a question. Um, what was the reason you were removed from the stage? Mm. The um, Office of Public Affairs in the region, the Board of Regents for the Smithsonian, um, being concerned about what either I or Anita would do or say, um, had likewise threatened the director of the Smithsonian organization that put this event on and said that if either I or Anita stepped out of line, that the director and all of the uh, curators would lose their job. And so that director uh, forcibly removed me from the stage and screamed at me in front of people. I mean, this, this exhibition was up for two days um, and 40,000 people came through those doors. So as you can imagine, there was, it was very crowded and very busy. Um, this woman was dropping F-bombs of me to get down and how dare I and who did I think I was. Um, and so that's why I was forcibly removed, uh, mostly because of fear, I think for them. They thought that they would lose their jobs because we were, um, doing something we weren't supposed to be doing, even though we were just intersecting. We were just in each other's space, honestly. Um, that's where that came from. So um, this work is uh, called the Invisible Series. There's a couple of versions of it, um, but mostly it's about occupying space with my body, with my voice, with music. Here I'm hitting a drum, I'm hitting a hand drum. Um, and related to this piece is this piece. Um, and this is the first set of works I've really been able to do with Sage. Um, she's 14 now and she's just a smart and talented uh, powerhouse of a young woman. Um, we had to do, we were actually asked to come and do this piece, but it was a year later. Um, and so she was 13 at that point. And if you know anything about teenagers at that age, um, this dress she's wearing did not fit. <laughs> like it, nothing fit anymore and so nothing was like viable and so I told her I said well we should put something together uh what do you want to do and I, I kind of let her take the lead on it this piece is called invisible she's wearing red she's wearing a red ribbon skirt a red shirt uh, she has a red handprint on her face um those are to denote uh an epidemic in Indian country 
uh, of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and what we call two spirit, which is a, a reference essentially to in English, what we would call LGBTQ uh, plus um, people who are coming from different uh, gender identities. Um, and within that epidemic, it's like a one in three chance that a native woman uh, or girl or two spirit will be uh, sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And that is 10 times the, the national average. So she came up with this idea that she would stand on this plinth and, um, and the plinth was the, the theme. Um, there was multiple pieces that were happening on this day and the plinth was something we were all supposed to work with. She stood on the plinth and she, she did a spoken word piece that she wrote at 13. And then she read the names of victims um, of this epidemic uh, within Indian country for the next 10 minutes. I was there in the outfit um, basically as sort of an ambiance sound. I was not, uh, I was there to be that shadow. I was there to be a presence and the drum that I'm hitting, um, I was hitting uh, very lightly in uh, sort of a heartbeat rhythm uh, throughout the entire performance. Um, and so this is something we did together. Greg, where, where is this? This was in Denver. This is actually downtown Denver um, in front of a convention center that's there that a lot of folks, when they go to Denver that for business, that's where they're going. Um, and likewise with these other installations, um, this is actually an organization that heard about the Smithsonian. My original piece um, was supposed to be a teepee filled with Ikea furniture uh, and it was gonna be called Modern Indigenous Living. And, um, and it got axed because of all the restrictions that were being given to me. And so the, this organization in Denver heard about this and asked me if they could raise the funds if I would be willing to do the original conception of this piece for them, um, which I did this summer. Um, this image I wanted to show you because there's reference in it to, um, to native civil rights movements as well as uh, it says, um, BLM on native land, Black Lives Matter on native land, because uh, there's a lot of parallels and correlations between those things. Um, but that's what like Red Power is from a Red Power movement in you know, the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, the sort of peace sign hand with the face on it, that's actually the symbol of the American Indian movement. Um, but this entire space was, was meant to be like existing in this space. It's called Modern Indigenous Living. Uh, and it is using native elements to sort of illustrate all these different little things. And my performance piece is actually just being in the space. Um, so you can see the punk rock series, which is called The Others. There's a painting in there. Um, there's a sign in there that says Columbusing, uh, the act of discovering something that is not new. Um, these are all little sort of nuanced things that exist within native culture, contemporary native culture that are, are kind of funny as we've gone through this process of asserting our own identity. Even the bookshelf um, the lower half of the bookshelf are uh, books written by white people about natives. And then the books from, this, from the second half up um, are books that are written by native authors. Some of them are fiction, some of them are nonfiction, some of them are political, some of them are historical. There's just a whole number of different things happening. And I labeled each of them. The ones that are written by white people about natives are labeled as fiction. And then the ones that are written by non-native artists or by native uh, writers and artists, regardless of their subject are labeled as uh, nonfiction. And the reason for that has to do with the way that we, uh, our stories are told and uh, whether or not we get to inform those stories. And we're at an, a point in time now where there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to tell our own stories. There's no reason that we shouldn't be able to represent ourselves within these spaces. The last one I want to show you is this. This is a mural I did this summer in Colorado Springs. Um, it's called uh, Take Back the Power. And it, Sage, of course, is the subject matter. Um, it stands 77 feet tall, which you do not realize how big that is until you're standing uh, in front of it. Um, and it's in downtown Colorado Springs, which is uh, politically the second uh, most conservative city in the country. Um, and we were able to pull this off downtown. Um, it's meant to the halo around her head is going back to that 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 point of divinity that I mentioned earlier. Um, she's wearing a band T-shirt to her favorite punk band, um, and uh, she has the red handprint on her face to denote missing and murdered Indigenous women. 
This is a statement of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, but it's also a statement of modern existence. And while it seems like such a simple thing, this is incredible. This has never happened before. There's never been a mural that's been made this big that is making a solid statement about modern ex indigenous existence and challenging Judeo-Christian ideas of divinity because we believe that our women are divine. We believe that our two-spirit are divine. We believe that our children and our elders are divine in nature. And so that plays a part in this as well. Um, and there's a, another mural that I created that is kind of along the lines of this, the same one, but just a different, of the previous one, but a, sort of a different set of circumstances. Um, and the other mural, the last mural that I did this summer was this one, which is part of that punk rock series, which seems appropriate given Black Lives Matter and everything else that took place. Um, this is from a song called American. There's an apostrophe M, American. A punk song by a band called The Descendants. It's actually a Bush era uh, punk song. It says, we flipped our finger to the King of England. We stole our country from the Indians with God on our side and guns in our hands. We took it for our own, a nation dedicated to liberty, justice and equality. And the native is saying, doesn't look that way to you. It doesn't look that way to me. The sickest joke I know. Um, so again, that sort of intersection of popular culture, um, American identity, and ultimately indigenous voice. That was a really long way to introduce this work <laughs> to you guys. Um, there was a couple of things I wanted to share along the way, uh, but I think that because um, we're doing a second round of this, uh, I believe on Wednesday, and I think we can get into that there. Um, so there's a little bit of historical context um, all of which would help point to understanding uh, modern indigenous struggle and why it's important to understand that context so that so that uh, allies can back us up and uh, educate themselves, educate their families, educate those around them and act as uh, a conduit of support for indigenous people and for indigenous struggle. So you ready for some questions? Yeah, we can do some questions for sure. Okay. Uh, if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand and uh, I will uh, call on you. And uh, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question, Greg? It looks like Lisa Shackelford asked uh, where the location was of, of us in that field. That's actually in the mountains of Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? So, so I have one and uh, oh wait, here's oh okay. Uh, I have one and then I will uh, and there's a lot of people saying thank you. <laughs> um, so so from my perspective, you know I um and I, and I you may t touch on this when we get to Wednesday. But you know um there the history of the indigenous people here is is before you know, the, the white man came, so to speak, there's, and then there's the occupation, the colonization, and, and then, you know, there's present day. Yeah. And how all those pieces fit together today um, um, are complicated. You know, it's, it, for me, it's, it's complicated to take in. You know, we, we talk about, you, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the history when, when there were, you know, trails and, and trading places and, and then that those being consumed by the, or, or co-opted by the, by the white Americans. Um, you know, I, I guess I wonder, I, you know, as I think about this whole history thing, you know, um, where, and, and again, let me talk about this one day, where Native Americans are going now and, 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 and what, they're, what they're really wanting, because I'm hearing different things from different people based upon this, sure. this entire journey. Um, things like, you know, the, 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 some of the uh, indigenous people here are, are talking about, you know, taking care of the environment. Um, I've, I've heard of people talking about reparations, um, uh, returning land, you know, so that this is a complicated issue. And I guess I'm, sure. I, I don't know, it's, a, it's clearly articulated, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are and, you know, how all these things are informed and, and where they're, where it's going right now. I think it's um, I think it's all valid, honestly. Um, I think that there's a number of different things because there's a number of different things that we're contending with too. Like the Navajo Nation is the largest uh, the largest 
tribal nation in the United States. They have the greatest amount of members of their uh, their tribal community and span the greatest amount of space in the United States. Um, they span over four different states, um, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and uh, Utah. And so these, these things, you know, going back to that sort of diversity of, of, uh, of representation and ultimately the diversity of, of thought, uh, half the Navajo Nation is uh, Republican and they are, uh, you know, really into all of that. And then there's like the other half, you know, that isn't. Um, and, 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 and I'm being, I'm being mildly general, I'm generalizing a bit because um, it might not be quite exactly half, but there's a significant amount of, uh, you know, conservative political thought that happens in those spaces. And so within those spaces, there's people that don't care about a lot of those things. They don't care about mascots. They don't care about appropriate cultural appropriation or representation. Um, they, they care about things that are, you know, different and whether or not that's valid, I, I suppose is up for debate, for debate. Um, but likewise, like the Lakota people, um, they want, uh, treaties to be, um, fulfilled. Um, the Black Hills were supposed to be theirs, period, and was ultimately, um, desecrated by Mount Rushmore, by the creation of Mount Rushmore. Um, if you can imagine your holiest place, um, and having your oppressor carve their the faces of their you know grand leaders into the side of that uh, sacred space. That's what happened with Mount Rushmore. But then if you look at the Mohawk, who weren't a part of the sort of treaty moments that were part of the uh, expansion West and manifest destiny, they're not interested in treaties. They don't want to have treaties with the United States. They want to have their own sort of set of circumstances. And likewise, each individual tribe has a different set of circumstances economically as well. There's a lot of tribes that have gaming facilities. And let me make clear, a gaming facility is not always a casino. Sometimes it's a bingo hall. And so, you know, there is this effort to create those spaces is meant to create an economy on reservation spaces so that they can take care of the roads and pay for schools. And the same as a state, they do those things. Um, and it's good to actually think of reservations like a state within a state. That's why you can have a reservation that has a large gaming facility in a state that doesn't allow gaming. And so those needs are different. My tribe is in Nevada where gaming is already legal. Um, there are slot machines at the gas station and some other places like everywhere you go in Nevada. Um, there's slot machines at the airport in Nevada. Uh, if you go um, within those spaces, like they don't have the same economical situation as they would in South Dakota. Um, and so our economy is very much based on the lake that we have within our reservation and the recreation that's created within that lake. And, and um, a lot of our efforts, like most of the uh, medical efforts are being um, facilitated through outside vendors that the tribe has created uh, has created a relationship with. The one place that our tribe specifically gets help from the federal governments on, on the medical side is through, um, is through uh, what is it, uh, prescriptions. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of high blood pressure and heart disease and diabetes and things. And so there's, uh, there's prescriptions that are medications that are uh, associated with that. And the federal government helps subsidize some of that to make sure that people get what they need. Um, whereas in, uh, there's a Lakota tribe in South Dakota, um, nearly everything that they have is being subsidized in one way or another by the federal government. So when Trump shut down the federal government last year at this time, um, uh, there were tribes that like literally had nothing. Like there was one tribe where their, their police force is actually funded through, um, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, and ultimately everything froze so people weren't getting paid. And so police were going to essentially have to shut down in a space where they were already being inundated by um, cartel that had come in and had set up shop and were growing. Uh, they were growing or um, producing drugs like methamphetamines. Um, and they were, it, it's just a total mess. And, and I don't know every particular of it, 
Um, but if you were to shut down the police force, it was going to be a, it was going to be chaos. It was going to create a lot of problems. Whereas my tribe, we were having difficulties getting medication to people that needed it. And so there, that's a vastly different set of circumstances um, within those spaces. There's another tribe that um, gets all of their subsidizing from uh, for uh, ambulances and things like that. So most of the tribes, it's a huge reservation area and most of the people don't have cars. So if there's a medical emergency, you're relying on the ambulance to come and grab you and take you to an appropriate place. Uh, the ambulance got shut down during that shutdown. And so people literally died in uh, native nations because of that shutdown. And so now I think a lot of tribes are realizing that that reliance upon the federal government all of which those were those those sort of subsidies from the federal government are um, not only validated through treaties, which are um, dictated under Article Six, Section Two of the Constitution as being the supreme law of the land, but they also are a set of um, obligations that the highest court in the land, the uh, Supreme Court, has dictated as being a federal trust obligation to native nations, whether they have treaties or not, that there's a federal trust obligation there to these nations. And these nations are realizing that we're too reliant on the federal government um, because there was people that were completely just, they were frozen in their tracks when that shutdown happened and created a lot of problems and that we need to be more self-reliant. But it becomes really difficult to be self-reliant when you are the lowest common denominator for economics, for health, for you know virtually every single thing that's happening. And even when we're talking about Black Lives Matter and, and Black men being sort of in a position or in a place of danger because it's inherently an inherently greater chance that they can or will be brutalized or murdered by police officers when that interaction happens. Um, Native men between the ages of 25 and 45 are more likely to have that outcome than black men. And I mean, it's really close, but it's native men between 25 and 45 or that. So I'm gonna be 46 this year. So uh, I get to be out of that, <laughs> out of that, that group. But um, yeah, so these are, the, these are the complex things that are happening. And that's why native nations have to be treated on an individual person to person basis, because you know what the Mohawk want are not necessarily what the Paiute want and so on and so forth. That's really complicated. I know it's really nuanced and sort of complicated. I hope I explained that properly. You did, and, and also uh, uh, Heather, just put your uh, your website in the, the chat so that people can uh, and look at some of your, your art and some of uh, things that you have there. Um, so, um, I guess I didn't specify the length of time, but I was going to say you've spoken for, you know, we've been in this for about an hour. I, uh, I guess I, I want to ask uh, you, do you, do you feel like we've uh, gotten to where you need to be to prepare us for, uh, for Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think if anybody was, um, you know, sort of socially or, or morally punched to the gut today, um, just wait for Wednesday. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be even better. Um, because there's a lot of things that, uh, like especially the, the events of this, this week, uh, I think have shed light on where we are at uh, from an equality point of view for people of color, um, the reactions that have happened there. And there's been, uh, you know, an enormous amount of things that have happened to Black and Indigenous people um, over the last five years um, that would, uh, that would really really shed a light on on what happened on Wednesday as being uh, just horrifically uh, in in unequal unequal yeah um, so yeah we can get into some of that and uh, and also just in terms of understanding that context you know where this stuff comes from um, even just looking at mascots I mean I, I could I can illustrate for you uh, both you know, from an academic point of view, but also from a personal point of view where I've had interactions with people that are just incensed by my audacity to question the validity of something like uh, the representation of a mascot or using a racial slur like redskin to represent those things. Um, that goes back to that thing I mentioned before about ownership, the, the ownership of our own identity. Um, but there's some really exciting things happening right now. And there's a lot of really smart native people 
that are pushing for change and have ultimately even enacted change. There is a Native American sitcom that's going to be on primetime television coming up. It's been wow. in the works for the last couple of years. Um, that to me, you know, whether it does well or not and whether or not it actually gets picked up, you know, uh, you know, for regular, regular viewing, uh, tells you that there's been some efforts going on that are pointing in the direction of equal representation. Well, Greg, I have to tell you, I have been, you know, from our conversation uh, on the phone this week and, and in uh, your presentation today and, and, and of course your TED talk that I, I watched. And, and for those of you who don't know, I just, uh, he, he put out a TED talk and, and I can send you the link for that. I mean, I, I feel like I have begun to understand a little bit better um, but I know that you're about to punch me in the gut on Wednesday, so I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, and uh, again, thank you uh, for, for being here today, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Sounds good. If you want to share that TED Talk, it's 13 minutes long. It's not very long, um, but that might actually help me uh, bridge, some, bridge some gaps as well um, so we can spend more time on some other things on Wednesday. All right, I'll be sure it goes out to the congregation and before we uh, get together on Wednesday. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I look forward to Wednesday. Um, if any questions pop up between now and then, um, I'm easy to find. I'm easy to get a hold of. And I answer all emails and, and all inquiries. And if you want to wait till Wednesday, we can also uh, talk to, talk then. All right. Take care, Did everybody. you add any of those Bye. connections? Thank you very much. To the chat now? What now? What, what, uh, what Sam? Uh, I was asking if some of those uh, links could be put in chat right now. Some of them you are could do already. that, Greg. Greg's, uh, Greg's in there. Uh, you can go to his website um, and also his Instagram. And I will, uh, I'll put his, uh, I'll put the link to his, his TED talk in there in just a second. Okay. All right. My Instagram's you. the most, the Instagram's the most current set of stuff like i'm on there pretty normally i update my website i'm terrible like maybe once or twice a year so um the instagram <laughs> will give you give you more current stuff thank you guys so much thank you so much see you wednesday thank you. See bye you. take care By coming in late, I think I missed some of those links that were already in chat. I got it. Here it is. No, there. Oh, there. Um, okay. That's for his TED Talk right there. Did you get it? No, I, I didn't. I'm not picking up any links at all in chat. Oh, I just put this one in. Let me see. I'll try it again. It's to everyone. Here, I'll try to send just to you, Sam. Did you get that? Yeah, I saw a direct chat, but I didn't receive it. <laughs> oh, well, let me send you by email. How about that? All right. That I'll send you the good. chat by email. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye, Heather. Bye-bye.